as well. So just before we get started, for those of you that are that are, maybe didn't see what was the ads in the beginning of the webinar, we do still have bees available. So if you uh, had any of your hives die, or if you have recently found that you're addicted to bees and can't get enough bees, we still have bees for sale. So we'll have bees uh, available through the month of August, and then we'll be shutting those sales down here in about three weeks. So uh, if you still need some bees, let us know. I'm pretty excited about this one. Um, we are starting to bring uh, global pollen patties to the South. Uh, typically global pollen patties have only been sold in uh, the Northern US and usually just to commercial beekeepers. And so um, we've, we've brought them to Texas and the South and uh, we're selling them on any scale. So if you need two patties or 2000, uh, we're a dealer for global pollen patties in, in the South. These are the pollen patties that I use in my commercial beekeeping operation. Um, you can get them with 15% real pollen or 4% real pollen. And uh, I, I think that they're the best on the market. So if you got our email uh, last week, or earlier this week, I believe, it kind of showed some of the research studies that have been done comparing different pollen patty diets. And, uh, you know, Global consistently performs in the top tier or number one when it comes to uh, which are better nutritionally for the bees. Now we announced this early this week and like within two days, we sold out of everything that we had ordered. And so we are getting a shipment in a couple of weeks to, uh, to have more Global patties in stock. So uh, hang in there. One other quick side note on Global patties that uh, I love uh, in Texas is that the bees tend to eat them a bit faster than most of the other diets. And so that helps with small hive beetles here in the South. If you, you know, want your bees to eat them quickly uh, so the small hive beetles don't start reproducing in your patties, the, these global ones, they, they do tend to eat a few days faster than a lot of the other brands, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, another quick announcement is uh, Texas Bee Supply is now an APMA hive dealer. Uh, which is which is really cool. Uh, we've been working on this for a couple of months now, and these are the heavily insulated hives. And so we will have those in stock here in the next 10 days or so. We should get our first shipment of those. And so we'll be talking a bit more about that later, but it's a pretty interesting uh, alternative, especially in this, the heat in Texas, that extra layer of insulation does seem to help a bit, uh, keeping the bees a bit cooler over the summer months. Last quick note is we do have queens available too. So if you need a queen, if your hive went queenless over the summer, we've got queens available at all of our branches. Uh, Sherry, do you want to tell us a little bit about the magazine this month? Sure, if I unmute my box there. Um, yes, it's a good one. How do you like that cover? The, the, we're not the Pretty only cool. ones trying to get a drink of water, right? <laughs> the bees as well. Um, I wanted to touch real quick on that at the beginning of the year, I started a new project where um, I'm interviewing an expert. We do have our expert videos, but this is an expert that we inter that I interview for about 20, 30 minutes. Please go to that in the magazine because it's really informative. This month I've got Skip Talbert and I was really impressed with Skip's input on uh, the honey production in the drought and how his bees were faring. So go in, click on it. If you don't want to uh, watch it in the magazine, go to our YouTube channel because it's on there as well. So um, I really encourage you to start watching that because they're good interviews. Um, and these, these folks have a lot of good stuff, good tidbits to tell us. So we need to keep that in our heads as we move forward. That's it. That's all I got. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah, as always, this was a really, a really cool month. And those, those interviews are phenomenal. I mean, there's so much information in those interviews. So super cool. Thanks, Sherry. Um, okay, so let's jump out to the bee yard and, oops, excuse me, I went too far. Let's jump out to the bee yard and see what's going on. We, uh, the bee yard visit is a little bit shorter this month because we wanted to give Jerry a lot of time and we've still got a lot of tips to cover as well. I am going to warn you guys in advance. Um, I am desperately trying to fix the audio out in the bee yard so that it's perfect. It's really hard to have an audio feed that uh, doesn't pick up too much of the bees' wings and uh, does really well in the wind and, and, and. So uh, the first video, uh, the volume's pretty loud. 
because I was trying a different audio source uh, and that audio source uh, didn't work out so well. And so the subsequent videos are a little bit quieter. So uh, you might want to turn down your audio a little bit for this first video and then be ready to turn it up a little bit uh, for the subsequent videos. So just a quick, uh, quick warning there uh, so you guys can uh, not have your eardrums uh, blown out by, by that audio. So, um, all right, let's go ahead and launch uh, this video. Welcome to the bee yard. So I'm actually filming this early in the morning. Usually I, I film these late in the afternoon and I came out here yesterday afternoon and it was 103 degrees. And so I said, you know, no thanks. I'm, I'm gonna do it early in the morning. And so I'm out here, it's early and it's a little bit cooler and it's amazing how much more bee activity there is. You know, yesterday afternoon in the heat of the day, you know, the bees are just sitting there, not flying at all. It's just way too hot. But you come here early in the morning and you can't see it, but there's a lot of bee activity. A lot of bees are coming and going from the entrances. And I watched the entrances for a while, which is always interesting to do this time of year. And there was virtually no pollen coming in. I mean, one in every 20 or 30 bees had pollen on her legs. Usually I wanna see every other bee, you know, with pollen on her legs, but there is almost no pollen coming in. One of the big things we're going to focus in on today is what do you need to be doing in your bees during summer and especially a summer like we're having this year where it's very hot and it's very dry. But I don't want to give you a bunch of just blanket statements on well here's what you should be doing. It's easy for me to do that because in general you know 90% of the time that's going to be accurate for your area. But there are pockets and regions that have had more rain than others and you might have a good pollen flow, you might have a bit of a nectar flow. And so what I really want to do today is dive in, look at only a couple of hives in detail and show you what you should or shouldn't be seeing in your bees and then what action should you should take as a result. To be a really good beekeeper, it's important that you know what is going on in your beehive in your area and then you take plan, take action accordingly rather than just, you know, going to a bee meeting or listening to me and saying, oh, well, you know, I should just do that. Uh, you know, that, that will probably work out for you most of the time, but the ultimate way to know what your bees need is by looking at your bees. And so I want to help you do that. And so we're going to dive into a couple of hives and we're going to look at the signs of, okay, does this hive need a pollen patty? Does it need mite treatment? Does it need food? Uh, does it need some shade? You know, we're going to kind of look at a bunch of different elements. So, so let's jump on in and see what we've got going on. All right, so let's take a deep dive into this hive and just really try to diagnose what it really needs this time of year and, and really try to identify some detail around you know, what I look like, look at inside of a hive to tell what they need. So this hive had the honey pulled off of it about three weeks ago. The deep box was put back up on top uh, and they've been fed about three gallons of syrup and they've had a mite treatment put on to this hive. So I always take a quick look at, okay, what do I have going up on, going on up in this top brood box? And this hive has, look at all that stored honey or stored syrup. It's got a lot. I mean, this is what every frame looks like up here in this top box. So with this hive in particular, we had pulled all the honey even out of the second box, which usually you don't want to do, uh, but we did this time and they've completely filled this box back up with the syrup that we have been feeding them and uh, that's great so a hive like this they've got this top box about let's see about two-thirds full of syrup which is sufficient you know we can really slow down on the feeding because they've got you know 30 to 40 pounds of honey or syrup stored up in that second box, which is kind of what we're looking for. So let's go a little bit deeper here and see what's going on in the bottom brood box. There was no honey stored at all in, oh, I'm sorry, there was no bees stored, brood, wow, I can't get my words out. There was no brood stored up in that second box, but we do have some brood in this bottom box you can see we've got some good cat brood there there's some more good cat brood but one of the things that I really look for is beyond the brood is 
uh, do they have pollen stores? And then what quantity of pollen? And I'm really looking for, you know, a cumulative half a frame of pollen or more. So if I were to add all the pollen together in the hive, I want to have at least a half a frame of pollen. And I want to have multicolored pollen. So when I'm looking at this hive, I'm seeing a number of things. I'm seeing some decent cat brood, as you can see. I'm not seeing a lot of eggs and larvae, which I do want to see. And I'm seeing virtually no stored pollen. So if you look at this frame, there's just no stored pollen going on. There's a little bit, you know, maybe 20 or 30 cells of, that have pollen in them in each frame. But, you know, when I look at a frame like that, that has some eggs and larva on it, I really want to see some pollen around the outside edge and maybe a, a good band of pollen. And I'm just not seeing that. So this hive has, let's see, one, two, three, maybe four, about four frames of, of uh, brood. But the population is fantastic and I really want to see a little bit more brood than that. And I bet there isn't more than a hundred cells full of pollen throughout the entire hive. So this is a hive that I believe is a fantastic candidate for a pollen patty because the bee population is good. They've got plenty of syrup, so they're fed enough carbs. They've got some brood, but you know, very little pollen. And all the pollen I am seeing is pretty much just one or two colors. And I really want to see that multicolored pollen uh, and, and at least a cumulative half frame of it. So a hive like this, they've got 30 pounds of stores up in their top brood box. So we're good on syrup. They've got a mite treatment in place. So I'm not really worried about mites. My goal is to give them a pollen patty and I'll reduce down the feeding to nothing. I probably won't feed this hive anything for the next couple of weeks because they've already got 30, 40 pounds in their second brood box. So I'll give them a pollen patty. I'll come back in seven days and I'll probably give them another one. A good strong hive like this that's a deep box full of bees or more should eat through a one pound pollen patty in about a week or less. So. I'll give them a pollen patty about once a week and you'll be amazed after about three weeks of doing that, they'll probably have much healthier looking brood and a lot more developing brood in, in this hive. And that's important, especially as they start rearing the generation of bees that are going to be surviving the winter. So nutrition is very, very important this time of year. So they're getting some pollen patties and uh, they should be in much better shape brood wise in the coming weeks. So while we're out here checking on this hive, let's go ahead and do a quick mite test. Um, these are really easy to do. I've got my uh, mite testing kit here. I've got it about half full of, uh, you can use 90% rubbing alcohol. I like to use um, the Dawn dishwashing detergent mixture. So I get one gallon of water and put in two tablespoons of liquid Dawn dishwashing soap, mix it together, and that's a great solution to put in here. So I've got it about half full of that solution. It's really simple, I just take the lid off. Now I saw the queen earlier, so I know she's not on these brood frames. And these are a couple of the brood frames I just pulled out of the hive to give myself room as I was checking through the hive. And you can see they've got quite a few bees kind of clustered on the edge here. And I just have this sheet of uh, kind of cardboard paper and I'm gonna shake the bees onto that paper. And I'm usually gonna shake about two frames worth of bees. I've got my open container. I'm going to funnel up the bees. And I'm going to put about 300 bees in the container. And there's a fill line inside the container that you can see, you know, where to put the bees in. And then I'm just going to swirl this container around like this for about 60 seconds. Now you don't want to shake it, you just want to swirl it for about 60 seconds. And then after you've swirled it for about 60 seconds, 
All you have to do is look on the bottom of this container and you'll be able to see those tan Varroa mites and you count how many Varroa mites you've got. If you've got more than about six Varroa mites out of this 300B sample, you need to treat or take some sort of action. But it's that quick and it's that easy and you're done. So one of my new favorite ways of doing uh, checking for Varroa mites is using a sticky board. And so we have these sticky boards that you can buy them with this protective uh, screen and it goes right over the top of the sticky board. And the purpose is to keep the bees off of the sticky portion of the sticky board. If you've got a screen bottom board, you really don't need this protective screen because this can actually slide right underneath your screen bottom board. Um, and uh, the screen itself will protect the bees from getting on the sticky part. So all you have to do to use these things is you peel off this stick, the uh, plastic to expose the sticky spot, the sticky part. You slide it underneath your screen bottom board, just like that. You wait 24 hours and then you count your mite drops. After 24 hours, if you've got more than about 10 Varroa mites, you need to do some sort of treatment or take some form of action. And if you've got less than that, you're good to go. So it's a very non-invasive, invasive, quick, easy way to test for varroa mites. So we'll come back and check this hive in a bit, um, in you know about an hour or two. You're supposed to wait 24 hours, but um, we'll come back in about an hour and see if there's anything left on it. So we're back at this hive that we put the sticky board under, and uh, you know about an hour later, you did, you know, ideally you're going to wait 24. Well, you must wait 24 hours right at 24 hours. You don't want to do it at an hour or two days because then it messes up those threshold numbers. But it's been about an hour and I was just curious to see if anything's happened and not much. I mean, there's a little bit of debris on here. Um, we've successfully uh, caught a small hive beetle. Uh, that's, always, uh, that's always exciting. I love catching small hive beetles. Um, you know, just as a quick reminder, a couple small hive beetles, you know, if I see under a dozen small adult small hive beetles in a hive, I'm really not that concerned. Um, if I'm seeing, you know, 20, 30, 40 small hive beetles in a hive, that's when I get a little more concerned. But um, I'm seeing some debris on here. I'm not seeing any varroa mites. Again, it's not a fair test because we didn't wait 24 hours. But uh, the concept is you just stick it in, wait 24 hours, pull it out, bring it inside where it's nice and a little darker and you can really count the varroa mites on this sticky board. And, um, you know, they're pretty visible, typically, even though they're small, they, they look different than other debris, and uh, it's not too hard to count. And if you've got over 10, then you need to take action um, under 10, and uh, shouldn't shouldn't be a problem. So really the goal this time of year, in general, is relatively simple. You're just wanting to make sure your bees have sufficient pollen in the hive sufficient honey stores in the hive and varroa mites are under control and beyond that there's not a whole lot you can do in the summer this summer in particular if you're in an area that's really hot really dry um, i'm recommending you make sure you've got at least two boxes on your hive they can get too hot as a single story hive make sure they've got 30 to 40 pounds stored up in their second box of syrup make sure they've got at least a cumulative half frame of pollen and if they don't then consider feeding them a pollen substitute, which in most areas in the South, I'm recommending you start now and giving them, you know, an, as much pollen substitute as they can eat in the seven day period. And then, uh, and then you can give them more after they've completely eaten that first patty. And then uh, other than that, it's making sure your varroa mites are under control. So two boxes, pollen patty, 30 to 40 pounds of syrup in the second box and varroa mites under control. And you should be in a good place to get your bees geared up for winter. It's a bit of the, uh, sorry guys, I was on mute. Uh, you, you'd think after like two and a half years of Zoom, we would have the whole mute, not mute thing down, but uh, not the case apparently. Um, so yeah, so, August tips. We're going to run through some, some August tips that weren't covered in the video, and then we'll be turning it over to Jerry. But summer blooms, <laughs> we always have this slide, right, where we talk about what's blooming this time of year in Texas and the South. And uh, I, I put question marks after it this time because there's a lot of areas where there isn't much of anything blooming. Even in the hardest hit drought areas, I'm still seeing our sunflowers bloom. 
but other than that, uh, you know, there may or may not be much blooming in your area. Usually we have crepe myrtles and thistles and sumac and, uh, you know, uh, there's a handful of things blooming, but we're not seeing a whole lot of that this year in many areas. This is a picture I put, I almost didn't show it guys. Cause I just, I get depressed when I look at it. This, I took this picture day before yesterday. Uh, this was in North Texas, but I, I saw similar things. I was in Southeast Texas last week. I was in East Texas. Uh, you know, I I'm seeing this in a lot of areas. This is the snow on the mountain or the snow on the prairie, right? This is our one of our big summer uh, nectar producers and pollen producers. Now, the downside of snow on the mountain is it makes your honey kind of spicy. And we always say, oh, pull your honey before the snow on the mountain starts to bloom uh, because it'll kind of ruin your honey. It'll make your honey spicy and not in a good way. More it burns your throat when you swallow it. And so you always want to get your honey pulled before late July because that's when it starts blooming. So this is it blooming, but I mean, it looks horrible and, and you can see that it's barely blooming and it's dying uh, even as it blooms. For, for reference, this was a picture from last year. This is what this awesome summer producing plant is supposed to look like. Uh, and this is what it normally looks like. And, and this is how it looks this year. So just some really, really rough conditions out there. Here's Kind of what I'm seeing across much of the South. I mean, the honey flow is completely over. I mean, every now and then I hear from one random person that says my bees are still bringing nectar in, but that is, you know, not the case. Ninety-nine percent of regions, uh, most regions have a very poor pollen flow right now, and I would, and and this is true. Uh, I've seen it personally with my bees scattered over the region. But then a lot of people are putting out dry pollen substitute, and the bees are foraging on it. And so it's an interesting test to see if the bees uh, are bringing in much natural pollen. Uh, go put, you know, Ultra Bee or, or some dry pollen mix out um, in the shade. And if the bees forage on it, they probably have almost no natural pollen coming in. Usually in much of the South and certainly in Texas, you can't put dry pollen substitute out and expect bees to forage on it unless it's the dead of winter. I mean, usually it only works in January because it means there's nothing naturally blooming. And if there's anything blooming naturally, typically the bees don't touch it. So in my region, uh, I can't feed this in the summer. Um, the exception is this year. Uh, the bees are all over it because there's just nothing for them naturally. So you can test your area, put some dry pollen substitute out and see if the bees forage on it. And if they do, I would definitely uh, at least get some pollen patties on them, which we'll talk about later. At this point, I hate to be a downer, but our fall pollen and honey flow is seriously in jeopardy. And that, again, not true of all regions. Some, some areas have gotten some, some rain, but in most cases, not enough. And so that, like that snow on the mountain picture, you know, we're starting to see that with broomweed and aster and some of our great fall nectar producers and pollen producers are just looking terrible. So uh, hopefully in September, I have a whole different story for you guys, but right now um, I am, I am personally prepping to be feeding my bees through, uh, through the fall. Uh, and of course there can be a big difference in, in regions, but you know, one of the most helpful tools that I use all the time is the U S drought monitor map. And you can go and you can click on Texas on that U S drought monitor map, and you can go down to the County level and see what stage of drought uh, your region is in. And that's pretty helpful to see. And, and Texas and all the states touching Texas look pretty scary right now. So and we're, we're only in August. Um, looking inside hives, you know, what am I seeing? Usually I see six to eight frames of brood this time of year on an, uh, most years. Uh, but this year, the queens are really starting to shut down. If they don't have the nutrients they need coming into the hive, that queen's going to start shutting down because they don't have what they need to raise the baby bees. And so I'm seeing more like four to six frames of brood in most hives, which is a little behind where I want them to be. And Jerry's actually talking about nutrition later, which is fantastic and perfect uh, because it's something on a year like this, we really have to be paying attention to. A quick reminder, we talked about varroa mites a lot last month, but you know, just keep in mind, varroa mites are the leading cause of hive death. And they, they hit peak populations in July and August. So don't rely on a visual inspection to test your hives. Do the sticky board test, 
Better yet, do the alcohol wash that we showed in the video. You've got to know where your mite levels are. Um, something else that a lot of folks uh, have questions about is uh, this time of year especially is bald brood. And I see all sorts of posts on social media. Some people say, oh, you've got bald brood. It's wax moss causing bald brood or, oh, it's hygienic behavior. It's a great thing. You've got bald brood. It means that your bees are pulling out varroa mites. And, and so don't worry about treating. You've got hygienic bees. So I want to just quickly talk about bald brood because this is a time of year where we often see it. And uh, if it's bald brood um, as a result of wax moths, so if wax moths are causing bald brood, it's usually a linear pattern because it's caused by wax moths tunneling through the honeycomb. And so you'll typically see kind of like this picture, more of a linear pattern where the, the wax moths have tunneled into that comb and, and caused a problem. There's often a raised lip around the cell, as you can see here. Um, and it's usually only found in small weak hives and where they aren't able to keep the wax moths under control. If it's hygienic behavior, it's very random. There's no linear pattern, kind of like this picture. The cells appear more chewed down. Um, it indicates the hive is removing larva or pupa infected with varroa. So it is a positive trait, right? I mean, we want our bees to be hygienic and remove those varroa mites and, and the pupa, but it's not necessarily a good thing. It often is an indicator that you have a mite problem and sometimes a serious mite problem. So you should be proactively testing this time of year, but especially if I'm seeing bald brood, I'm really gonna be testing and seeing if I may actually have a problem. And then if I have more than those two mites per 100 bees, then I'm going to certainly be taking action. I threw this out last month. And again, watch last month's webinar if you want a bit of a deeper dive into varroa mites. But suffice to say, you can see with this picture, we're in uh, the peak trend uh, right now for, for varroa mites. So definitely not something to ignore. Uh, doing nothing about varroa mites is never an option. Uh, you have to take action against them in some form. Okay, we're gonna to touch on feeding. And this is my favorite thing to do this time of year is trickle feeding. Uh, we've talked about it before, so this is more of a reminder. Um, here's what I'm recommending as far as feeding. Start feeding pollen substitute now. And, and that's a bit earlier than I usually recommend it. Usually I recommend it starting in you know, late September, or late, uh, late August or so. But uh, I, I started recommending feeding it back in July just because of the weather conditions we're seeing. So I'm giving my bees two pollen patties per month um, and for, for strong hives. And I'm giving them about as much as they can eat in a week. So what I do is when I have a hive that is one deep box full of bees or more, then I'm giving them a one pound pollen patty between their two brood boxes. And then I'm going back in seven to 10 days and I'm assuming they've eaten all of that pollen patty, I'm giving them another pollen patty. The reason I don't want the pollen patty, one single pollen patty in for more than about seven days is because small hive beetle larvae can really start making a mess of, of a pollen patty. Now, I don't usually see that in really strong hives. If I've got a double deep hive full of bees, they're able to keep the small hive beetles under control usually. But if I've got a hive that's a bit on the weaker side, you know, I especially don't want to give them more than they can eat in about seven days. Um, so if I've got a hive that's less than a deep box full of bees, I may tear that one pound pollen patty in half, put half a patty in there. If I go back in seven days and they haven't fully eaten it, I'll probably pull that remnant out, throw it away and give them a fresh piece uh, just to get rid of any small hive beetle larva or eggs. But some people are really afraid to give pollen patties in the South because they're too concerned about small hive beetles. Um, I'd be more concerned about your bees not being cared for nutritionally than I would small hive beetles. Just uh, don't leave it in too long and you should be okay. For sugar syrup, I'm feeding one fourth to one half a gallon per week until my second brood box has 30 pounds stored in it. And then I'm stopping feeding and checking back about every two weeks and seeing if I need to feed them a little bit more. But giving them kind of that trickle of nutrition throughout the summer, rather than just dumping a whole bunch of syrup in there for a one to two week period, um, sen seems to keep the queen laying a little bit better. Because uh, if you just give them four gallons of syrup in 10 days, uh, they can overcrowd, they can uh, 
backfill the brood nest, become honey bound, and then the queen really starts shutting down. So I prefer that trickle over a long period of time. This is a great thing to look at this time of year, well-fed larva versus hungry larva. You know, we, you, when you look at larva in your hive, you should be seeing those, you know, 24 to 48 hour old larva should be floating in royal jelly. You don't want them looking very dry. They should have an abundance of royal jelly around those larva. And if they don't, then I'm feeding, uh, especially pollen substitute to make sure they've got the nutrients they need. And you're probably looking at that going, yeah, right. How am I going to see, royal, I, you know, how am I going to see royal jelly underneath uh, larva? And the answer uh, is your smartphone uh, or magnifying glass, which works too. But I, I'm always going out, taking close up pictures with my smartphone and then zooming up on that picture, which is what, what was done here. You know, picture was taken with the smartphone and then you just zoom up and you can see pretty clearly if you've got those puddles of royal jelly. This usually isn't an issue in the spring. I usually see this more in the summer and fall where the bees don't have enough nutrients to properly feed larva. And that's an indicator. I better give them some supplements. Well-fed versus overfed. You know, the picture on the right is what I want to see in my hives. I want to see that thick band of honey around the brood. I don't want to see this picture on the left where uh, you've got a little bit of brood and the bees have just completely filled everything with syrup that's an indication you're feeding too much or too fast and you need to back off on that feed a little bit. I always still want to see, you know, five, six, seven frames of brood in my bottom box. Uh, I don't want it to be all frames of honey. That's obviously an issue if you've just got, you know, six frames of honey in your bottom box and only two frames of brood. So you got to kind of balance out your feed rate this time of year so they don't have an issue with backfilling. So this is kind of what I'm seeing in, in my hives right now. Um, this is a picture, a video I took this morning where you can see you've got brood, but you can see there's just no pollen uh, on these frames. And this is what I was seeing uh, in pretty much all the hives. You can see you got a little bit of bald brood there too. And these hives did have a mite treatment on them because of that. Um, but you know, you've got a sprinkling of, of pollen. Occasionally you see a cell or two with pollen. Like if you look at the beginning of this video, you can see right here uh, on the bottom right, you've got some pollen. It's all pretty much the same color. And, and that's as much as I was seeing throughout the whole hive, just kind of a scattering of cells. And, and that's what really makes me start feeding that pollen substitute. You know, I'm looking for that cumulative half frame of pollen or more, and I'm looking for multiple colors and I'm just not seeing that. So that's when I'm stepping in as a beekeeper. So to kind of summarize all that, this is what you need to be going for in your hives this summer. 30 to 40 pounds of surplus honey or syrup stored in the second brood box. Um, as a reminder, 30 pounds is one medium box, 90% full, or a deep box, two thirds full. Test for mites now. I should have tested for mites about a month ago, but if you haven't tested, go ahead and test. Feed two pollen patties each month now through October. Equalize brew between hives if needed. You can check out our fast our July webinar. I think we talked about equalizing brood. And then make sure each hive has a second box or is in the shade. Because, you know, I, I saw I saw a little diagram that the Texas Department of Agriculture put out last week that showed the ground temperature. You know, when we have these 105 degree days, you know, they were saying asphalt is 150 degrees. You know, concrete's 130 and your unshaded lawn is 110 to 125 degrees. So pretty hot if your bees uh, are in a single box, you know, that's just gets too hot for them. So make sure they've at least got two boxes in total or they're in, in shade or in, in at least partial shade in the afternoons. So get them in the shade. Uh, second box, you can put a little upper ventilation that helps. Screen bottom boards help. Or you can just put an empty, deep, or medium box on the top of your hive and then put the lead lid on. And that dead air space can be very helpful. This was, these are some temperatures I took. These were single story hives out in the, uh, the sun. This was on about a 95 degree day. And the one on the left was a really strong single story hive and the internal temperature was about 100 degrees. The one on the right was a weak hive. It was less than, uh, it was maybe half a box full of bees. They were all the way up to 105 
which is very dangerous levels for inside uh, the inside the cluster inside the hive. So stronger hives do a better job of regulating their temperature. Weaker hives really struggle. So if you've got weaker single story hives, um, get them in the shade this summer. Of course, don't forget about water sources. Uh, if you, you know, a lot of our ponds and lakes are drying up. So uh, you do need to provide a water source for your bees. Um, keep in mind as you're working in the summer heat, keep yourself safe. Um, work the bees early in the morning or late in the evening. And that's not just for your bees sake, that's for your sake, um, but it is better for the bees. You know, it's just tough on the bees to have them open and kind of break up their fanning uh, when it's the heat of the day. Don't try to gauge a hive population in the heat of the day. I'm telling you, you can go out and look at a hive at three o'clock in the afternoon and it's like, where did all the bees go? And it's just so hot. The bees are lower down in the hive. Um, we're maybe hanging underneath the hive or they might be outside the hive altogether. Uh, gauge a population early in the morning uh, because they're just, you know, it's going to look like they're dead in the heat of the day. Don't leave frames exposed to direct sunlight in the heat of the day for more than 30 seconds. I've worked bees at three o'clock in the afternoon, left a frame sitting out for a couple of minutes and the wax is all melted off of it. So uh, keep that in mind and then try to keep your inspections brief um, uh, because the longer that hive is open, the more disruptive it is to it. Um, I would expect to see increased bearding and reduced flight. If you see this much bearding going on in your hive, I might, uh, whoops, I might go ahead and add uh, another box to give them some uh, break from that temperature or try to get them in partial shade. But increased bearding and decrease in flight is, is pretty normal uh, this time of year. I'm gonna skip that. Uh, well, I'll touch on it really briefly. Uh, we've got a couple minutes uh, before we start up with Jerry. Um, open feeding. Uh, I've got a lot of, I've had a lot of questions about open feeding with uh, pollen substitute or syrup. Just a real quick reminder, you know, the pros of open feeding either syrup or pollen substitute is that it can help simulate a honey flow and encourage brood rearing. It's fast and easy. Um, the cons are that you're trans possibly transmitting varroa and thus viruses as you've got bees from all over the place rubbing shoulders. And then you're also feeding all the bees in the neighborhood. So, uh, you know, it, it's got some pros and cons. It's not going to hurt anything typically. I mean, it, it's, it's not a bad thing to do, but I usually prefer putting pollen substitute or syrup directly in my hives so that I can regulate how much my bees are getting. Oftentimes when you're open feeding, the stronger hives get stronger and the weaker hives get weaker. So um, I usually prefer putting things directly into the hive. Uh, but open feeding isn't necessarily going to, to hurt anything. So, um, okay. So, uh, as, as we get ready for Jerry here, um, I just, I wanted to share, and we will include this, um, in our follow-up email to our webinar that of course goes out to everybody, but, um, Jerry may tell you a little more about it, but they have an event, um, uh, coming up. Yeah, it is, uh, September 30th through October 1st. And it is a pretty incredible lineup of speakers. And uh, it's in Ohio, I believe, right, Jerry? Yes. Um, yes. So it's a fantastic event. I mean, it's one of the better programs uh, schedules I've ever seen. So um, we'll include all of the details and a, a link to and the, and the flyer in our follow-up email. But um, really encourage you guys to go to that in, uh, in late September and the 1st of October. Uh, it's, it'll be a fantastic, fantastic event. Um, I met Jerry, uh, a long time ago. Uh, and, uh, I was, I don't know how old I was, but I was just getting started in beekeeping. I think I was, I think you were, I think, I think you were 12, Blake. I, think I, I was 12. probably, I was probably 12 <laughs> and it's, it's, it's crazy when you meet your heroes. And I, I always remember Jerry cause he came up and said, hi. And, and I was just blown away. I mean, this is the guy that I'd read articles by him and uh, just blew my mind. And ever since then, I mean, Jerry has been incredibly kind to me and uh, he um, has always been supportive and he's one of the smartest beekeepers in, in the entire industry. And his resume is long and he's done everything there is to do. And 
when Jerry says something, I, I pay attention. So I, I, Jerry, appreciate your friendship and appreciate you speaking to our group tonight. Um, I think we've got about uh, several, several hundred people on here tonight that are very eager to hear what you have to say. So um, thanks for joining us. I'll, I'll turn it all over to you, Jerry. Well, no, thank you so much, Blake. And after all those kind words, I should probably stop now because it, I can only go down from here, you know? <laughs> no, but let, let me make a couple of comments. I have an opportunity, and of course, like all of us the last several years, um, to uh, uh, do, uh, yeah, Zoom presentations and, and conferences on Zoom and, and what have you. And uh, this is the first time I've, I've been on uh, this one for Blake and, and Texas Bee Supply. And this is amazing. This is, is terrific uh, educational outreach. One of the comments I generally make in my talks uh, is that uh, one of the worst things that's ever happened to beekeeping is the internet uh, because there's so many uh, uh, people out there who are now global experts and uh, and uh, you know, telling you things that aren't vetted, uh, aren't uh, from uh, experience, uh, and and aren't accurate. Uh, but uh, what you've just listened to for the last half hour, forty five minutes from from Blake is just outstanding. Uh, so um, I yeah, I I vote for for this above anything else I've ever I've ever seen. This is this is outstanding. Um, couple things. Um, been in the industry a long time. Um, actually, since I was young and good looking as well. Uh, and now I last uh, several years, I've had the opportunity to be editor of B Culture magazine. Um, and uh, if you aren't a subscriber, I would encourage you maybe to go to our, our website and take a look at past issues of B Culture and what we offer. Uh, there to you for educational outreach as well. And then we have a, a daily email blast called Catch the Buzz, which we try to do short, um, uh, valuable information about the beekeeping industry as, as well. And there, there again to, and I bless Blake's heart here, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, our, our October event that we had to cancel for the last two years because of COVID. Uh, and going to be in Medina, Ohio, but it's it can be in person, but we're also offering Zoom as well. And, and let me just give you, for those of you who are recognize some of these names, uh, Sue Kobe, uh, you know, international leader in, in world, uh, New World Carolinian Breeding Program, Jackie Park Burris, Queens. Uh, we have Tammy Horn Potter from Kentucky. Uh, we have uh, Tracy Ferrone, uh, our, our bee vet, uh, author in Bee Culture Magazine, uh, Kim Scrim, who is uh, Chief Inspector for Massachusetts uh, uh, Department of Agriculture, and, and many more. So um, I'm excited about this as well. And, and if you'd like to know more about it, there again, go to uh, you know, www.beeculture.com events and take a look uh, there. We would like to have you join in uh, if you can. As Blake said, we're going to uh, talk about uh, nutrition uh, tonight. Let me see if we can, I can get my, uh, uh, woo, Blake. Uh, Jerry, you should be able just to uh, share your screen. Yeah, I did. Um, I hit shared screen and, uh, yeah, it said this will stop other screen sharing. Do you want to continue? Yes. And I hit continue, and then I hit that, and none of my stuff is coming up. Um, like, what am I doing wrong here? Good question. Um, let me see. Oh, I think you've got it now. Yep, we see your screen now, Jerry. All right, okay. I apologize. That's what happens. When... Perfect. Yep, we got it. Okay, all right. Okay, nutrition. Um, we all know about nutrition. We all eat every day. Hopefully we're eating amazingly good things to help our, our bodies and cholesterol and heart uh, conditions and energy and, and what have you. Uh, and 
we're all familiar with the food pyramid of what we're supposed to eat and uh, how much and, and grains and proteins and, and vegetables uh, as well. And then our diet changes um, from when we were a baby. When we were a baby, our digestive system, our gut microbiome um, is designed to uh, take uh, mother's milk or formula, what have you, that can be digested and uh, extract all the nutrients so that the baby can grow. And as babies grow, as we all know, uh, you know, they can start eating some softer foods, if you will, uh, and then they're making this transition as well uh, as they grow to be able to digest different foods. And then for those of you out there who uh, are either bike riders or runners or weightlifters or yoga enthusiasts, uh, you know, there's sports nutrition because when we're doing these activities, we burn up. Uh, a lot of calories, uh, we're uh, uh, breaking down some muscle tissue that's replaced and needs a protein to do that, to build muscle. Uh, so sports nutrition is possible because we need to eat to win, whether it's uh, an athletic event or just uh, in this mortality. And then uh, as we get older and older, uh, nutrition and, and aging, there again are our digestive system changes. We don't digest uh, foods as well. Our microbiome changes and uh, uh, we have to eat uh, different things. This is actually a picture of me uh, later, uh, earlier today. And so uh, uh, yes, our diet changes there as well. And then animal nutrition. We know, golly, we know all about how to feed a cow or a pig or what have you, so that we can harvest it and, and get the nutrition from those animals, chickens and, and, and even fish and, and what have you. We know how to feed uh, every animal, livestock, uh, and even in zoos, it's called zoo nutrition. We know how to feed elephants and armadillos and everything else you see in the, in the zoo because it's been studied, researched, uh, so that these animals can be healthy in the zoo and even reproduce in some cases. <clears throat> and now we're going to talk about honey bee nutrition, which is, as, as you heard Blake say, it's a little bit more amorphous uh, because of how honey bees interact with the environment. There's a great publication, it's got a few years on it now, but it's called Fat Bees, Skinny Bees, and it came out of uh, Australia. And it talks about some plants that we may not be familiar with uh, because it is Australia, but it gives a good description of, of honeybees, uh, what they collect uh, and uh, the nutritional value of those. If you wanna take a, a look uh, to see what might be at least in the environment growing that brings the most nutrition to your honeybees. Because this is, this is what it is. This is uh, obviously a forager out and going to collect pollen. And <clears throat> not to be offensive here, but just think about this, this relationship. You know, a, a gazillion years ago, most of the plants out in the environment were wind pollinated, kind of like our, our pines and cedars and grasses where they make a lot of pollen and they throw it basically into the air and let it float around and then cross their fingers and hope it lands in the right spot uh, on the uh, uh, plant flower so that it can produce the seeds so that they can uh, reproduce themselves. But at some point in time, uh, some plants uh, said, gee whiz, you know what? I don't, I don't wanna do this. I don't, I don't wanna have to make all this pollen and kind of just arbitrarily throw it into the air. I would like to uh, go over and uh, mate with that plant on the other side of the field, uh, but I can't pull myself up by the roots and walk over there and do it. So I'm going to uh, uh, interact. I'm going to talk to uh, this insect over here, this honeybee, 
And I'm going to give that honeybee a little uh, reward, uh, some sweet sugary fluid, nectar, uh, and say, will you take my pollen over to that other side of the field, to that flower, and help me reproduce? And so over time, this relationship built uh, between honeybees and, and these pollinator dependent flowers. And I find this amazing because these are two separate species. These are plants and an insect that have decided to work together, to cooperate, uh, to help each other. Uh, we're the same species and we can't even cooperate. And so this is kind of amazing and we should take a lesson from them here. <clears throat> because in a honeybee's world, this is what allows them to get protein, vitamins, minerals, all these things, lipids. Uh, and you can see uh, these pollens are different colors uh, because each plant produces uh, different color pollens that has different tannins and flavonoids and different uh, value layers of proteins, vitamins, minerals, fats, and, and what have you, because there again, honeybees are, are looking for this food pyramid of, of plants to have this diverse diet based on those plants that they're visiting in a couple mile radius of their colony. <clears throat> so, but honeybees don't eat pollen. They can't eat pollen. They don't have crunching, chewing mouth parts that can break open that pollen grain and access the nutrition that's in it. So bees don't eat pollen, they eat bee bread. And bee bread is, is a, a kind of a fermented pollen, kind of like pollen yogurt, if you will. You've seen the pollen stored in your cells. And, and so this is this fermentation process that preserves it for X period of time uh, to allow the bees to store it and access it uh, when, they, when they need it, if they can. There again, different color pollens. And you can see where the bee bread has been removed from the comb on the right side here. It's, it's in layers as the forager comes in, she actually goes up to a cell and scrapes off uh, the pollen from her legs, from her corbicula, and it's packed in and a little honey is added to it. And then the next bee will come in and, and add some. So there'll be a variety of different pollens, perhaps, depending on what's in the environment uh, in, in these cells. So you're only seeing the tops of the cells and what's being brought in. But this is what bees can access uh, more readily than they can uh, actual pollen grains. This is a, a pollen grain. And, and remember this pollen grain uh, has uh, the genetic uh, elements in it. It's basically a, a container for the plant sperm, if you will, uh, that needs to get to uh, the stigma on another plant. And when it does, it grows this pollen tube that you see on the right and then releases uh, those sperm to go down to uh, theoretically uh, fertilize an embryo uh, in that plant and produce a seed, to have a viable seed. And this pollen grain, because uh, you know, it's out in the open, it's exposed to the sun, it's exposed to UV, uh, maybe rain, uh, boy, in the, in the heats that, uh, uh, you know, Blake said that you were experiencing in, in Texas, uh, and all these things, it, it has to protect that sperm inside that pollen grain. So it has a hard coating on it called an exine uh, with a little uh, pore in it called a micropore, which that pollen tube can grow down through, but it's contained to protect that. And the bees can't, can't chew through that. They don't have chewing parts. So uh, this fermentation process of, in bee bread uh, many times causes pre, what they call pre-germination. It'll cause 
uh, the pollen to germinate, if you will, uh, and allows that sperm to come out because that's where the nutrition is for the honeybee. It's in that. Uh, and, and so this is, this is kind of a, a, an, an awkward way of, for bees to gain nutrition, for the nurse bees to gain nutrition so that they can feed their sisters, but this is what bees do. And in that fermentation process, um, this is uh, what uh, organisms are found uh, in the fermented food, in the bees crop, and all these organisms are working towards releasing nectar and pollen uh, because there's different uh, microbes uh, in the bees uh, mid gut and in the gut and in their crop. And then of course with uh, pollen being exposed and out in the open and nectar exposed, uh, they're collecting you know, fungus and yeast and bacteria that the bees are consuming, kind of like you or I when we're eating at a buffet, uh, same thing kind of happens. So these are the organisms that uh, have been identified and uh, please uh, memorize those. Those will be on the test at the end of this uh, presentation. That's a joke, okay? This is the uh, bee's basic digestive system. It's crop. So when the bees consume nectar, what have you, it goes into the crop. It's a holding area uh, because the bees will, will share food with each other called trophallaxics. You've seen these pictures of bees with their mouth together. Well, they're sharing food that, that's in this crop. Uh, when that isn't necessary, then that, uh, nut that nectar uh, bee bread, what have you, can move through uh, the, the, the digestive system uh, to be digested uh, and then, of course, go out uh, and uh, go out to the rectum and be excreted. And a cool thing about the honeybee's digestive system is <clears throat> in, that, uh, in that gut, and this is part of their immune system as well, there's a lining in their gut, it's a detachable lining, and which I'll explain here in a minute, uh, but it's kind of like cheesecloth, uh, it's permeable. It has very, very small holes in it, but what happens is that when this food bolus, a hunk of food moves down through it, digestive juices can flow through this paratrophic membrane, digest, that bee bread that's in there and that nectar releasing the nutrients and those nutrients can flow out the opposite way through the paratrophic membrane <clears throat> and be absorbed by the bee. And this paratrophic membrane I mentioned is also part of the immune system because it, it has very small openings which allow those molecules of nutrition, proteins and vitamins, minerals and fats to go through. But there are some viruses and some bacteria that are too large and can't make it through that paratrophic membrane and there, so are trapped in there. So when the digestive system moves on, this paratrophic membrane detaches from the gut wall. And you may all have seen this as beekeepers. And you know, we all, as beekeepers, we kind of all look at things. Have you ever noticed, primarily in spring, because that's when they're doing it more, bees, when they poop on your car, there's two poops that you will see. You'll see that splat, and then you'll see that poop that's like a string or like a thread. When it's like a thread, that paratrophic membrane is intact. It has, it's holding, that fecal material that's been excreted by the bee. When it's a splat, that paratrophic membrane has been damaged. And most of the time it's damaged because of nosema. Nosema apis, nosema serena, <clears throat> when they're in the gut in millions sometimes, they'll throw out uh, uh, a thing, it's almost like a harpoon, a spear, that goes through the paratrophic membrane and into a cell on the other side and they 
inject their genetic material into those cells so that they can make no more nosema. But it's damaged the paratrophic membrane. And when there are millions and literally millions of nosema of spores in the gut, and they're all doing this, that paratrophic membrane can be damaged in a major fashion. And this is where you see that splat on your car. But when that happens in the bee, remember that uh, some of that fecal material is getting out. Maybe those viruses and bacteria are getting out as well. So bee nutrition is just not one thing. Uh, it's the health of the bee in many ways. In this case, uh, it's nosema as well. What the bees are looking for is a, is a yeah, is a nutrient called vitelloogenin. And it's basically a, 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 a protein sugar process, glycoprotein that's stored in the fat bodies of the bee. And, and here in Ohio, I didn't tell you I'm in Ohio. Here in Ohio, uh, our days are getting shorter and winter is going to be coming. And so August, September is when winter bees are being produced that store more vitelogenin in fat bodies because of our winters are so severe here uh, that the bees have to use those stored fat reserves many times when they can't access either stored uh, honey or access feeders uh, that are in the, in the colony. And this is what varroa mites feed on as well because it's high nutrition. Uh, and this is why you need to get varroa under control as well uh, because if the honeybee isn't healthy and their fat bodies are small, they're not going to survive the winter. Glands in the top of the head of the honeybee called hypopharyngeal glands produce this liquid food that's fed to uh, larva uh, that uh, you saw those great pictures that, that Blake took. Um, and so having healthy nurse bees, healthy, there again, varroa, if there's three words I want you to remember, it's varroa, 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 uh, because of the negative health impacts uh, they can give to a honeybee colony if they're not under control. Uh, and just, just think about this, if, you know, the, the metric is if you have more than three mites per 100 bees when you do your alcohol wash or your Dawn dishwashing liquid wash, um, you know, you need to do something because that colony might be dead. It just doesn't know it at this, at this time. And so having uh, healthy bees is, is important. And these nurse bees uh, have to be healthy because they're the ones that are going to be feeding their baby sisters, the larva. And so having a good nutrition, basically from natural sources, um, is, is the goal because um, that nutrition um, is more balanced, if you will. This is a diagram of all the glands in a honeybee, but you can see that hypopharyngeal gland is kind of in the forehead of the bee. Uh, and it's close to its mouth parts so that it can uh, excrete uh, uh, this liquid food um, in, in uh, feeding uh, their sisters. And this is what you wanna see, uh, the larva floating, if you will, in this larval food, uh, because they are consuming that uh, very quickly because, you know, from an egg's an egg for three days and then, uh, you know, uh, 18 days later, you have a, a bee emerge. And if they don't have the right food or the right amount of food or the right nutritional com composite of food, uh, your bees are going to be smaller and, and weaker. And when they're smaller and weaker, uh, they can't do what uh, they want to do or you want them to do. Because this is uh, where the, the best food comes from. It's the natural sources, natural flowers. <clears throat> And just think of foraging efficiency from a hive location. If, let's say a honeybee foragers can forage efficiently. 
that means that they can <clears throat> burn up less energy going out and coming back than they're collecting. If they can forge in a two and a half mile radius of their colony, that's uh, you know, a little over 12,000 acres. Close your eyes and think about your colony and then visualize if you can, I, you know, I don't know any of us can, what's in 12,000 acres around your colony? What uh, plants uh, are blooming or could bloom? What agricultural crops are there? What trees are there? Um, what is out there that allows a honeybee and the environment to cooperate are helping the environment. They're allowing uh, all these plants to reproduce as we talked about earlier and uh, for farmers to get a bigger crop and for backyard gardeners uh, to get a better crop and, and uh, you know, fruit tree growers and all this other kind of stuff. So in that 12,500 acres, there's a lot of, of potential of, of uh, nutrition that uh, your bees can, can access. And this is just a, a picture of, of what, uh, you know, what a honeybee might be looking at when she's out looking for, for flowers blooming. Because this is what she wants. She wants to bring in those pollen grains, those pollen grains that have that uh, exine around them and contain uh, that sperm. Because that sperm there again is the nutrition that the honeybee is trying to access. And she'll, of course, groom all this down to her legs and, and bring it back. But this is that relationship uh, between a honeybee and a pollinator dependent flower that they've built this relationship over the millennia. And there again, what do bees eat? Uh, yes, they eat bee bread, don't they? Bees do not eat or process this stuff well. We as beekeepers want to help our colonies. We want to support them. We want them to be healthy. We want to be good managers of honeybees. Uh, we, we want to take care of them, you know, just like we would uh, a pet or a dog or cat or cows or what have you. But bees don't eat soybean flour well. Um, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not familiar to their microbiome. Uh, sometimes the particles are too large. Bees don't eat, uh, you know, egg whites. Uh, bees don't eat rice powder or sorghum flour or yeast or anything else. This is stuff that we have picked off the shelf and kind of modified to think that the bees will eat it. Because 40% of sugars in soybeans are toxic to honeybees. Why would we do that? And then look at uh, you know some of these uh, homemade uh, uh, patties, uh, supplement food patties down there. And we've all done it. We've put uh, mixed something up or even bought something and put it in a hive, and the bees, you know, line up around the edges, and uh, you know, and they say, "Yes, man, look at those bees eating that stuff." Well. Sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't because those patties are stuck together with sugar syrup. Most of the time, the bees are licking that sugar syrup off, kind of like a Tootsie Pop, and dragging that other stuff out because when we put a patty in a hive, that's not where bees find food. They'll take that easy sugar syrup, but that's not where they find food. That's where they find trash. And so years ago, um, when I was doing some research uh, as the chief of the apiary section for the Florida Department of Agriculture, uh, we uh, uh, tested some of these uh, patties and we put what are called debris traps on the bottom of the hives. And debris traps are just exactly what they say. The bees, in order to get out uh, of the hive, uh, will have to go through this kind of a, a maze if you will, 
uh, in this debris trap and they kind of get tired of it after a while and whatever trash they're dragging out, uh, they'll drop it in the debris trap instead of actually taking it outside and removing it from the hive like they're, they're doing as the hygienic bees do this as they take trash out of the hive. And so what we found was that uh, about 70% of uh, these patties uh, were being uh, uh, dropped in the debris trap. The bees were hauling them out as trash. Now, the 30% that they were eating or disappearing or what have you, um, probably gave them some value at some point in time, but the 70% certainly didn't. And when we feed uh, bee sugar syrup, you know, sucrose is, is good, uh, but some uh, other sugars uh, reduce the lifespan of, of honeybees. <clears throat> and so this is where you want to be sure that maybe not using high fructose corn syrup, but maybe using sucrose uh, will there again reduce the stress because our, our bees are under continuous stress all the time uh, from uh, the environment when it's 105 in uh, Texas, uh, when they have varroa, when they have small high beetle stress ores, you know, when they have no SEMA and all these kind of things. And so anything you can do to lower that stress level because you're providing good nutrition to them is something to consider. Because there again, uh, and this is a, a canola field in Canada, uh, because this is what bees are looking for. They're looking for uh, natural foods. And let me get on my soapbox for a minute here. There is approximately 50 million acres, 50 million acres of suburban lawns in the United States, taking 18 million pounds of chemicals and 10,000 gallons of water each above and beyond rainfall. Uh, to make them look like the 18th hole at Augusta. Uh, and, and a beautiful lawn uh, requires a lot of things and mowing and all these other things, but it, it doesn't provide anything. It doesn't do anything other than look nice or meet the qualifications of your, um, you know, your neighborhood or whoever is watching your lawn. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a resource black hole. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't provide anything for pollinators. Uh, you know, you don't see a cow grazing here. It doesn't do anything. And so if you can convert, you know, some part of your lawn <clears throat> to uh, maybe pollinator friendly plants and some legumes or some clover or something, uh, it doesn't have to be your whole lawn, but just think if we could convert 5%, 10%, 15% of 50 million acres, I think that would uh, be an amazing thing for us to consider. Because there again, you don't have to dig up your whole lawn, but it can be that around your house or that spot in your backyard or, or what have you that provides uh, some food, some resources uh, to pollinators and hummingbirds and monarch butterflies and all sorts of other insects uh, that uh, uh, actually help us um, help us as humans and help the environment uh, be healthy. So um, I'm going to end it there. Well, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for a great medium here, uh, Blake. I mean, this is really the best I've ever seen about how you uh, present information, educational outreach to those who want to participate. Um, this is fantastic. So keep doing it. Good. Well, I appreciate it, Jerry. It's wonderful to see you. And uh, we, we really, really appreciate you. Well, thank you. Yeah. And everybody stay, stay uh, safe and well. And remember, we're beekeepers. We're all in this together. Take care. Absolutely. Thank you, Jerry. Bye-bye. For, uh, for all the other listeners, guys, we will see you in uh, September. And in the meantime, we'll be praying for rain. And, uh, and again, it's just fantastic to have Jerry on and uh, he's always such an incredible wealth of information. And it's wonderful to hear a wide variety of perspectives. And that's one of the things about beekeeping is, you know, they often say if you uh, want it, if you ask uh, five beekeepers the same question, then you'll probably get 10 different answers. And so 
um, I'm always a huge advocate of um, hearing a variety of thoughts and opinions and then experimenting in your own operation. And so um, learn from everyone, experiment with your own bees and see what works. And don't, don't, uh, don't blindly follow what I say. Don't blindly follow what Jerry says. Don't blindly follow what any beekeeper says, but um, experiment with your bees and your region and, and, and see what works. And, uh, and so it's, it's phenomenal to, to hear all of those types of opinions. So as Jerry said, stay cool and keep putting questions in those Q&A and Sherry and James and I'll hang out and answer those for you guys. And uh, if you have specific questions for Jerry, we can try to get those to him uh, after the fact as well, if you wanna let us know. So with that, we'll shut down the webinar and we will see you guys uh, in a moment.